Needle. Needle. If y'all will for our opening hand, let's turn to number 226. 226. We'll stand and sing. three verses, which will be our text tonight. Acts chapter 1. Mike and Karen made it to Texas uh, yesterday and had let me know, and we miss him already. <laughs> and uh, Brother Bob, uh, one of his sons is in the hospital. So him and Vicky went to go see him this evening, so... Remember them as you can. Acts chapter 1, beginning in verse 12. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem a Sabbath day's journey. And when they were come in, they went into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon Zelotes, and Judas, the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. Let's pray together. Father, if you will, meet us in this upper room tonight. You've gathered a great number of people in this place. I pray it's your gathering. Lord, sinners born of Adam. So many cares of this world and so many things to occupy our time and weather to deter us. And You were pleased to Put living souls, eternal souls, in this upper room. Send your spirit and let us hear of Christ. Teach us what you do in these places. Lord, commit this to our hearts and don't let us forget it. Be with every soul here tonight, Lord, and be with our brethren that aren't with us. and Draw them, Lord, as you see fit. It's because of Christ we ask it. Amen. All right, brethren. Acts 1. Titus' message is the upper room. 
the Lord told these brethren to go to Jerusalem and to stay there until he sent his Holy Ghost to them, and then he was going to send them all over. <laughs> He's going to preach in Jerusalem and, and all over. And that word's going to go to the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. And it's going to come all the way to us here tonight. But he said, for now, he said, you go to Jerusalem. Look here in verse 4, Acts 1, verse 4. It says, I'm being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem. But, and our Lord speaks, wait for the promise of the Father, which he saith, you've heard of me. Wait for the promise of the Father. Now you go there. And they went. That's the text we're going to look at tonight. That's the text we're going to look at tonight. They went, okay? If y'all want to look down, let's look over to Luke 24. Look over there. We'll see this journey before we get there. Luke 24, verse 50. This is how Luke closes this, his record of the gospel. Luke 24, 50. It says, And he led them out as far as to Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. That's what we looked at last week. The Lord was carried up in a what? A cloud. And I got a picture of the clouds today. It was absolutely breathtaking. The Lord just took a paintbrush. And it was better than any painting I've ever seen. It's gore. I stopped on the road and took a picture. I said, this might be it. I hope my brethren's looking up and seeing these clouds and saying, look what a marvelous thing the Lord's done. Maybe he's on his way right now. But he went up into heaven, verse 52, and they worshipped him. They worshipped. That's an important word. Are we here to worship? Do we know what worship means? Do we know what that word means? They worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem, as he commanded over in Acts 1, right, with great joy. They were happy. Remember those angels told him, they said, he, you, just, you just saw him go up? That's how he's coming back. And he told you he's going to come again. Now go do what he told you. <laughs> go wait on him. And they did, and they were full of joy. It says great joy. Verse 53, and were continually in the temple, praising and blessing God. Amen. Now it says there that they worshiped him. They worshiped him. Mankind talks about there's going to be worship services on Good Friday. There's signs all around this county and this, that, and other. What's worship mean? I heard what somebody describe it. I couldn't find that in any lexicon or anything but it was worthy ship he's worthy and he is well i don't know if i feel good does that make a difference in his worth to be worshiped I, I told brother tom harding that 20 years ago i said tom i don't know that that i'm the lord's child i don't think i'm a child of god but i know he's worthy of being worshiped whether i am or he ain't or i'm not and he said i think you're on to something son <laughs> Yeah, that's when in doubt, worship him. He's worthy. That's a good explanation. But the, you know what that ain't what the word means? Well, what's it mean to you? We could all buy this place would be packed to the teeth if we'd all sit around in a circle and I let everybody go around the room and say what they thought that text meant to them. It'd be packed. We ain't here to hear what man thinks. I ain't here to hear what some some old writer thinks. I want to know what God says. You know that that word's a combination of two words. Right there where it says worship, they worshiped him. The first word. You ain't going to find it there. Look up here. The first word's direction. Facing towards. That means you're turned from something to something else. You're turned to him. You ain't looking at yourself. You ain't looking at the word or the world. You're not looking at the conditions around you. You ain't looking at conspiracy theories. You're looking to Christ. And the second word means coon. And I thought that was precious to me because we call them coon dogs. <laughs> That's a dog that hunts coons. It means dog. That's a Greek word for dog, and it's as one that licks its master's hand out of adoration, out of thanksgiving, out of love. Would you want a dog licking your hand that was belly aching? It might bite you. <laughs> it might take a finger with it, shouldn't it? Is that, are we turned from everything, from ourselves, from what we think worship is, and do we just go to our master and adore him and lap him up? like a dog. Oh, I've never heard of such a thing. Well, God calls that worship. They worshiped. They turned from all their ideas and their experiences and their thoughts and what the grandma and grandpa did and everything they considered to be true and they turned to him, a person, 
and they just lapped him up. I'll take anything you give me. If you scratch my head, if you give me a bone, I don't care. I just want to wag my tail and be by your feet. That's what I want. God calls that worship. Now, is that what we call? We need to learn to call it that, don't we? If he'd, if he'd teach us something and we could unlearn all, all the things, we if, like Moses in the first 40 years, if we could unlearn 40 years worth of learning and our intellectual acumen and put all that crap behind us and, and, and him teach us something. I guess that's offensive. I'll get old English. Put all that dung behind us. How about that? Is that better? God might teach us something. He may save some souls by doing that. If we could shut our mouths and open our ears and hear him speak. I could not get that printer to work this evening. I wasn't going to have any notes. I probably don't need them. <laughs> Worship him. Worship him. They did that in an upper room, didn't they? But they didn't just do it in an upper room. They did it in the temple, didn't they? And they didn't just do it in a temple. You know where they did it, Cass? They did it in their homes. They did it in their place of business, whether they were employees or employers. They, they did it in their schools. They did it whenever they was homeschooling their kids or teaching kids how to be homeschooled. Whatever they did, Christ was on their mind. And that impacted their daily walk. It wasn't just on a Wednesday and on a Sunday. It was morning, noon, and night. While they was pumping gas or feeding camels, whatever it was. He got a hold of them, and he dwelled in them, and his his they were he was on their thoughts. We'll look at more what that is in a little bit. Not just in that upper room, and, and you know what that is? That's a testament that they believed God, and Christ said, "You believe in God, believe also in me." I go to prepare a place for you. And I'm gonna come back and get you. That's where we are. The angel said he's on his way back. Yeah. All right. Acts one. Let's look back a little bit in verse nine. Acts 1, verse 9. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. He told you to go to Jerusalem. That's a good helper, isn't it? <laughs> I know you want to sit here and watch, see if he does something else. He's there, and he'll come back when he, when he comes back. Just same, in the same way he went up, you're going to see some clouds. Now, go on. He told you to go to Jerusalem. Here's where we pick up from last week, verse 12. Then returned they to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. That's about a mile. That's how far there's allowed to walk. And first used to suburbs. All the Levites lived outside of the city in the suburbs. It's a mile. Okay. I'm going to give you five W's. Who, what, where, when, and why on what takes place in these next two verses. Okay. I thought all week about rearranging the we'll do where first and or the why first and the when first and I thought, well, I'll just give it like that, and if the Lord's going to bless it, he'll, he'll bless it in spite of me. And I pray he'll do that. Verse 13, who was there? We're going to talk about this upper room. Who was there? It says in verse 13, And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where abode Peter, both Peter and James, and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon Zelotes, and Judas, the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. Now, who was there? That's the first W. Who, who was there in this upper room? This upper room. Well, there's 11 apostles there. That's the remaining apostles. Isn't it? He lists all of them by name. And, and they said there's women there. Women there. We read over in Luke 24 at the Lord's grave, or at the tomb, there was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and other women that were with them. There was a lot of women there, wasn't it? His mother was there with them. I thought that's something. You know, what's this world call the, our Lord's mother? The Virgin Mary. The former Virgin Mary. You know, she had children after she had the Lord. <laughs> that, only, that was only for a little bit, wasn't it? 
But here's this chaste one that's, I was a virgin. Oh, we pride ourselves in those things, don't we? In such an educated culture. Who else was there? Mary Magdalene. Here's one that had never been with a man, and here's one that sold herself to any man that would have her walking by. Both of them. You see the opposite ends of the spectrum there? Both of them. Mary, the former virgin, and Mary Magdalene in the same room together. What was they doing? They was being of one accord. Mm. You know those mean people? Those people we don't like in this world? Ought not be none. Ought not be none. That might be our brethren, huh? What a thought. You think they got along? I stole this from one of my brother, brothers. It's just too good not to use, I have to tell you. Do you remember Ruth, that Moabitess? Oh, don't even look at him. She come all the way up there with Naomi, bumped into Boaz. It was her hat to light on that field. The Lord put them together. Didn't he? I love how he writes. So modest, <laughs> his doings. And, and she, Boaz fell in love with her, and she fell in love with Boaz. Could you imagine her meeting her family members going in there and meeting her mother-in-law? She said, oh, mother of Boaz, I have loved. I love you. I like the way you got your house set up. I like the way you talk. I just, you're such a role model for me. I like the way that you make biscuits, and I like the way you make your roast in the oven. You're just, and you're so put together. Just, you're always dressed so nice and your makeup so good and your hair's put up and you worship God and you know him. You remember Boaz's mom's name? Rahab? She said, honey, you don't know the half of it. <laughs> I look up to you so much, Rahab. Well, sit down and eat, honey. We'll be, we're a lot more like than you think we are. You think she stuck her nose up in the air? I said, well, back in my day, we would have never done this. No. <laughs> No, she is Rahab the harlot, sitting there with Ruth the Moabitess, and both of them's in the lineage of our Lord. And he counts himself with us. Can you believe that? He come down to this world for us. Something we ought not forget. It says, with his brethren. Who's that? Mary's other children. Mary's other children. Hey, there are brothers here. Those are brethren, brothers and sisters, right? And, and James and John, they're brothers, aren't they? What about Peter and Andrew? They're physical brothers, aren't they? James and Thaddeus, that's Jude, the other Judas. They were brothers. I, we have some brethren here that are physical brothers and spiritual brothers. I've never experienced that. I never had to be something, though, wouldn't it? What a blessing that is. What a, a double honor the Lord's blessed a family with. There's families represented. The Lord blesses them. They command their households. And they honor God, and God honors them. Somebody ought to tell folks in this generation that God ain't lying. It's the truth. That's a blessing, isn't it? Lord, come to him and do those things. That's a precious thing. But being in that room to worship God earnestly, to the only, and not because it's Wednesday, but to be in that upper room to worship God because you have to be where his people are and you have to hear a word from him. You know, that makes us closer than blood relatives. We esteem those more than our blood relatives. Turn over Mark 3. Our Lord did. Do we want to be like him? Mark 3. Verse 31. There came then his brethren and his mother, and standing without, sent unto him, calling him. And the multitude said about him, and they said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren without, they're outside, seek for thee. Your mom and your brother and sisters are out there, and they won't talk to you. And he answered them, saying, Who is my mother or my brethren? And he looked round about on them which sat about him, and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. Would that offend you men in here? If the Lord said, you're my mother, I'd just hush and assume he is right, wouldn't, we, wouldn't you? Or, or you, you ladies in here, what if the Lord looked at you and said, you're my brother? Would we correct him? That would be precious, wouldn't it? He said, this is my mother, this is my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of God, the same as my brother and my sister and my mother. He said, what's the will of God? That you believe on me and you adore him. Not, you don't agree that he's God. He's your God. 
If you don't agree that Christ is the only way that mankind could be saved from their sin, he saved you from your sin. Not that he's the only one that can show mercy. I need mercy. And he showed it. He heard. He heard. Well, what were they doing back in Acts 1, verse 14? Who was there? A, a great multitude of a wide variety. Huh? <laughs> In-laws and outlaws. Everybody was there. What were they doing? That's who, what? Verse 14. These all, all of them. Good, bad, ugly. Mary Magdalene's and Mary the former virgin. And the brothers and the ones that weren't brothers. And the apostles and the disciples. All of them. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. They were there praying. They were all together because of their Lord, praying to their Lord in prayer and supplication. That's what we'd read back in Luke 24. They were continuing in the temple, praising and blessing God. Now, you, you just consider what was on their minds. The Lord had just ascended. They watched it happen. And for the last 40 days, he, he was crucified, was buried, and rose again from a tomb 40 days ago. And he walked this earth with them. And he appeared to them. And he talked to them. And he said, I'm about to go to my father. He said, but you're going to have the comforter. I'm going to give you something to do. <laughs> I'll be with you. It's going to be all right. And he comforted them. And he talked to them. And he encouraged them, didn't he? They saw this. They saw him walk through this world. They saw him ascend on high, and they had the promise that he's coming back for them. That's fresh, isn't it? Fresh in their minds. Do you think they were concerned about the mayor's race? Do you think what they wanted to talk about in this upper room was Super Tuesday? Do you think any of them was concerned about their, their good cholesterol levels or their free testosterone? Not a one. Their hearts, they were, they were in, in union. They were united. They were one accord, one accord with their hearts on their master like a dog turned to him and licking his hand. And they were praising him and praying to him and blessing him and saying, he's been so good to us. And he's left us with a promise that he's going to come back and get us. Let's just sit here and wait. Let's sit here and thank him. And talk about the good things he's done, not that we've done, until he comes back. One of the old writers said, this was the purest form of the modern church. <laughs> Anybody that wasn't in that room wanted to kill him. <laughs> it was pretty cut and dry back then, wasn't it? You weren't there because you wanted to be. But I want to be a warrior for Jesus. Huh. Until you see heads on pikes out in front of everybody's front porches, you might change your mind on that one. Everybody wants to be a warrior until the bullets start flying. This was serious, wasn't it? The Lord just spoke to them. What were they doing? They were praying. What happens in a church service? Old Brother Parks put this in his bulletin. And I had done half this, and it's out of order, and I thought, well, I'll just copy his article because it's done. <laughs> a church service following scriptural orders of simple service. He said, we want to attend the church that Christ attends. Is that where you want to go? Not a church, not any old church. I want to be where he is. It's a simple worship service. Saints praise the Lord and bless his name, Psalm 100. They sing with and to, to one another with God-honoring hymns. That's Ephesians 5 and Colossians 3. They exhort one another, Hebrews 10. They observe sacri the sacred ordinances, especially the Lord's Supper, Acts 20, 1 Corinthians 11. They pray to God and God answers them, Acts 4. They hear God's servant preach the gospel. They were there praying, wasn't they? Paul said in Ephesians 6, he said, You take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints, and for me, and for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly and make known the mysteries of the gospel. I can give knowledge and understanding. They were praying. They were praying. What was going to happen? Well, the Lord wasn't there to preach to them no more. They've been preaching for a few years, haven't they? Peter's about to preach. He's getting ready to. 
And I thought, oh, Lord, whichever one you put it in their hearts to preach, be with them. Give them a message. I want to hear the gospel. Out of that 120 that's there, all of them, I want to hear Christ exalted. I want to hear man abased. I want to, I want to see him in these scriptures. Show me. I probably forgot. Show me again. And be with that one. Make them say it plainly and just say what God said. That's a miracle. They were praying for those preachers, weren't they? How often should we do that? Turn over to Luke 18. Luke 18. Speaking of this prayer, Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5, Rejoice evermore, period. Pray without ceasing, period. In everything, give thanks. He's saying the things that make you happy, give thanks. He said in everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you and me. Pray without ceasing. Rejoice. Be thankful. Be thankful. Luke 18, verse 1. <clears throat> and he spake a parable unto them to this end, for this cause. This is why he gave it to them. That men ought always to pray and not to faint, not to quit doing it, not to fall over. Verse 2, saying, There was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man. I don't care about God, and I don't care about you or any other man. Yet, because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. She won't hush, and she's bothering me. And in case this gets worse, I'm just going to avenge her and get this over with. <laughs> it ain't because I like her. It ain't because I. That's how we ought to operate. We ought to judge things. Uh, two people in my household got called for jury duty. What a blessing! God did that, and then you might go set a court of law and see how this court works, and then you'll be reminded how God's court works. That's a good thing. And you older folks that's retired ought to volunteer for it. God might teach you something, and it'll take it off these working folks. But this was a wicked judge, and he didn't regard God, and he didn't regard man. And he said, just because this woman won't let off of it, I'm going to give in to her. Verse 6, and the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge saith? This judge ain't just. This judge doesn't fear God, but do you hear what he did? Do you see that? And shall not God avenge his own elect? He told the apostles, he said, if your children come and ask you for a fish, you wouldn't give them a scorpion, and you're evil. What do you think the Lord's going to do? Shall not God avenge his own elect, which cried day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? He may wait a while before he answers them. But those that cry to him, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Speedily. Right early, David worshiped it. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? We have the faith to pray to him and praise him, worship him, whether we get any fringe benefits out of it or not. I know a lot of people that's come to churches where the gospel was preached and they wanted to get healed or have friends or, I don't know, list something that's a positive in mankind's world, and they didn't get that, and it didn't take long, and they quit coming. Well, that's good, faithful brother so-and-so. No, it ain't. They were out for number one. I want the Lord to make me faithful till he comes, just to praise him. Not to get have, have, have some kind of benefit for Kevin out of it and not to make my life easier or anything else, just pray him because he's worthy of being praised. Back in our text, our next one. Where would all this take place? We know who was there. A wide variety. Whosoever was there. We know what they were doing. They were praying and praising and thanking God and praying for them about to preach. Those that had to go into this world and preach all over it, the Lord told them what they was going to do, and they said, well, we're going to need some help. You all pray for me. <laughs> where was this? Where did this take place? Verse 13. And when they were coming in, they went up into an upper room. The Greek translation, the literal translation, is the upper room, a definite article, the, not an upper room, not one of a bunch of other upper rooms. The, the original Greek is the upper room. This could be referenced as where the Lord gave his last supper where he gave his table went up over mark 14 it said he will show you go to this man you tell him you're going to observe the passover and he's going to show you a large upper room 
furnished and prepared. You tell him this is for you, for me, and he's going to show you this room, and it's big, and it's furnished, and it's prepared. Mm -hmm. That's a picture of God's church throughout time. Did you know that? That's what this upper room represents, the upper room. He, he brings us out of this cesspool of this world and brings us up to, to think on things of him and his kingdom. Is that up? We always we go down to Egypt. Egypt blows sea level. It's down them slime pits. He brings us up to Bethel, up to his house of bread, up to Jerusalem. No way. That's his church throughout time. That's where the Lord meets his people, his bar, body. And that's a large room. It can fit a number that no man can number. Close my eyes or somebody lifts over the airwaves. There's room for you. <laughs> Come in this room. There's plenty of room. And it's furnished. You don't have to bring anything. Everything's neither. Well, what if we got to, the stuff that's there? Do we have to get it ready and assemble the furniture? No, it's prepared. Everything's done. It's all finished. Just come. Just come. That's the upper room throughout time. But this is also every upper room. And, and some of y'all's been to some of them. I think everybody in this room has, at least one. You've been to some local assemblies where the Lord meets with his people. And you go there, and what do you think? Well, this place is well furnished. Everything's prepared. The <laughs> Lord's prepared that message real good for my heart. And they got it good. Didn't they? We had some visitors recently. Did they tell you that you got it good here? They think this is a nice room. They think it's an upper room, not a mediocre room. That's where God deals with, dwells with his people. <clears throat> that's, that's the local assemblies. But I got I to gotta make this real clear, though, too. This is just a building. This is just brick and mortar, okay? In Appalachia, they call them the church house. We're going to go to the church house. We've got to clean the church house. We're going to have a dinner meal after services at the church house. It's just a house where they have church. It's a building that has church. The, the, the church meets. The church is the Lord's body. That's his people. He says he abides in us, and we just happen to congregate to stay out of the rain in a building. If I had my, we're a little bit up a hill, I wish we was higher on a hill. <laughs> I do. That's, that's what them people back in poor old Appalachia call things. You know what th those people say? They say, I reckon. I reckon. What hillbillies? You know where they got that? They, only, they can only afford one book to read in the house. And that, they learn how to read out of that book. And they learn things like, Likewise, reckon yourselves also to be dead indeed to sin. Impute. Account yourself. Mark it down because it's done. That's what reckon means. It's closer to the King's English than most of the people over in the UK. It's unadulterated. But it's in an upper room. And it's up high, isn't it? I mentioned this last service. The Lord said, you're the light of the world. Not, well, this, this building is a light of the world. He said, you. Kevin, that's too strong. Well, he said it. <laughs> he said, you're the light of the world, a city that, that is set on a hill and it can't be hid. Christ in you, that light's going to shine forth in this community. We're going to get into that later on as we go through Acts. That's how he's going to build his church, is us having neighbors and us having employers and us having people we know at the stores or whatever, people we come in contact with. But set on a hill, it can't be hid. David said in Psalm 40, he said, He brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. He's lifted us up, hasn't he? And we come in this upper room to hear about that. What's Zion called? Mount Zion. Up. <laughs> Where would the Lord go? He ascended. He went up, didn't he? And, and how... How we view that and have, ought to be precious wherever the Lord has a local assembly. That's how we ought to view and treat our brethren and especially treat those that come bringing good tidings of, of good things, those that come preaching the gospel. I want us to get that. If so, we ought to be like Abraham and get the best calf that we can get, not some old ruddy buck out there. Go, go get this, the best meat we can have. We, we put our best foot forward for those that's preaching because the Lord ain't come yet, and, but we want to be good to them. That's what I was talking about. Where did Rahab hide those spies that came to her? In the basement? Did she hide them down low? Like, get down there. I know it smells a little moldy, but it won't get you. I put bleach down there last week. We'll give you an hour. No. She hid them up on the roof of the house and hid them with stalks of flax. <laughs> up. She put them on the roof. 
And I got to think about that. You know that wasn't all he won? Elijah. She went to a widow and <clears throat> she fed him a cake. And then she fed herself a cake. And then she fed that son a cake. He said, you're going to stay with her through this drought. And she's going to provide for you. And he lived with her. That whole drought that he prophesied of. And then, then that, that woman's son fell sick. And she came to him and she said, What do I have to do with thee, O thou man of God? Art thou come unto me to call my sin in remembrance and slay my son? We always think that, don't we? If some kind of bad thing happens to us, and we say, What did I do? <laughs> That's what Job's miserable comforter said, didn't it? What'd you do? Bring us evil. God's punishing you. No, he's not punishing you. He might be chastening you, but <clears throat> Elijah spoke to that woman. He said, unto her give me thy son and he took him out of her bosom and he carried him up into a loft where he abode and he laid him on his own bed where'd he stay she put him up in the loft it's warmer up there in the winter time you go up there you get the best room to have that Shunammite woman she gave Elisha bread every day when he walked by and she went to her husband one day and she said to her husband behold now I perceive this is a holy man of God which passes by us continually he's always coming through here let us make him a little chamber, I pray thee, on the wall. Not out of sticks and mud, up on a stone wall up high. And let's put him in her bed and a table and a stool and a candlestick. What more does he need? <laughs> He's got a place to sit, a place to sleep, and a candle to study with. And it shall be when he cometh to us, he shall turn in thither. We've got a room set just for him. That's given to hospitality, isn't it? Lord said, one in a thousand shall flee at the rebuke of one and the rebuke of five shall you flee till you be left as a beacon upon the top of a mountain and as an ensign on a hill. We're going to make an ensign. Remember what an ensign was? That flag, a banner, Nisi. We're going to be put up on top of that hill and be made like Jehovah Nisi. He's going to be our banner and we're going to declare him. He's going to put us there. If we're his, we're going to. Up high in an upper room. That's where they were. That's where we are, bro. And not back down to the dregs and not back under the law. Above, up, <laughs> upper room. Back in our text. When did they do it? Verse 13, Acts 1, 13. Got to who, got to what, got to where they did it. When did they do it? Verse 13. And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and it lists them. They might as well say they live there. <laughs> They're there all the time. Every time you drive past, they're there, ain't they? He abode there. Look at verse 14. These all continued. They continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. They didn't quit. They were there to the end. Well, they used to go there. And, and like people, I heard, you know how many people I know that used to preach the gospel? Whew, that's frightening. I pray I ain't one that's chalked up to used to believe in God and used to preaching his word. Used to following him. I want to follow him. I want to continue. I want to abide there. Just bring you sleeping back down. I live here now. <laughs> Y'all got to run me off. I want to be where his people are. I have to. That's my family. It's more important than my real than my uh, blood family. My family, I had them. What we call real family. That's the real family. We read, I told you that first Thessalonians 5, pray without ceasing. They were there. They didn't quit. And they didn't quit praying. And they continued praying. Paul said in Ephesians 6, Pray always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit for all the saints. Pray without ceasing. Pray always. What's that mean? That is not saying your prayers. That is not saying your prayers. Will you say, will you give grace? I can't give grace. Will you say grace? Grace comes out of his lips. It's important. The Lord taught us a lot about prayer. We don't know much of it, but I want to learn, don't you? It's not, it's not quoting God's scriptures back to him. They didn't sit there and just chant and say, well, this is a good scripture that goes along with whatever's going on that day. Just say something. It's communion. The prayer without ceasing is a unity. It's an intimacy. It, it's a constant consideration of everything all at once. It just ebbs and flows. He's our prophet, he's our priest, and he's our king. And those clouds today were so beautiful. He's a creator. He was. Who controls those? That's a good question for you. He does. It's his providence. He controls everything, doesn't he? 
I want my loved ones to be saved. Who's going to do that? That's him. Go pump gas in your car. Isn't that a that, that combustion engine amazing? The Lord gave somebody sense enough to do that so that way I could drive around and go preach real easy. I ain't got to walk and go through 10 pairs of shoes a year. Not do me some good. <laughs> we think on us and our brethren. Think on them all day and all the time it just comes and goes. It's like you're breathing in and out. It don't stop. That's praying without ceasing, not sitting around humming like a monk all day, saying chants. Turn over to Psalm 10. Psalm, Psalm chapter 10. I want you to see this. These brethren, we read there in Luke 24, how did they go down to Jerusalem to this upper room? It was with great joy. What David said, I was glad when they said, we got to go to the Lord's house today. They was happy, and they prayed without ceasing. Psalm 10, look at verse 4. David speaking, the Lord says, The wicked, through the pride, I want to get there, Psalm 10. If you get back to Job, you went too far. Go right. Psalm 10, verse 4. The wicked, does he say the brethren and good faithful brethren? And He says the wicked. The wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. He don't think on God all day. What goes hand in hand with not thinking on God all day? And we might think about God things or what we think church things or churchy things or something like that. But he doesn't think about God because he doesn't know him. What goes hand in hand with not thinking about God? Verse 5, his ways are always grievous. Are your ways grievous? Has my week been just horrible? Oh, this day's just been so long. Oh, my back hurts, and this is bad, and that's bad, and so-and-so sick, and I, I got on to, I preached out loud. I don't know who listens to this thing, but I said, do you ever see me hand out a prayer list? No, and if God keeps me, it won't happen. You know, I started getting two prayer lists consistently in my name all the time. I mean, big ones. Pray for so-and-so's neighbor's cousin. Why? That they come to church and God save them? Well, they got cancer, so they're going to, they need to come to church sooner. That's what they need. Not that that cancer goes away. They need Christ, not an oncologist. That's the true need. His ways are always grievous. We think about God all day long, who he is, not, not just that we offended him or something like that, but are we happy? Do we have joy in, 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 in him? Not in our lot in life, not in our situation, not in us. But in him, when we hear him, this is him, that's what he did. He brings us that upper room. Does that make you happy? Or is that grievous? Thy judgments. He's saying your, your judgments, Lord. His ways are always grievous. But your judgments, Lord, are far above out of his sight. I don't know why, I don't have a clue what the Lord's doing. I can't believe God wouldn't do something like that. That's the wicked speaking. That's the unregenerate speaking. What's the Lord's people do? Let's think on him. And whenever I forget to think on him, you remind me to think on him. You start thinking on him. Don't say, Kevin, no, you need to be doing this. Just say, you know what the Lord did for me today? That'll that'll light my fire. That'll stir up my pure mind. That's why I said you either sugar him up or shut him up. Somebody starts talking to you about things that don't matter and they're goldfish. Just start talking about what good things the Lord's done for you. And if they have no clue what you're talking about, they can't talk and they'll quit bothering you. Or if they're a brother or a sister, they'll say, you know what? That's right. The Lord is just fabulous let's talk about that let's dwell on those things what's he doing saving his people and getting all the glory for it what else we need to know that's something why did they do this who's there riffraff <laughs> what are they doing praising god and thanking him and praying for folks where's this at an upper room when all the time might as well live there why why do such a thing why why Forsake all these worldly good things. The Lord says, this, I gave this earth to you. Enjoy it. Go up to Yosemite. Look what he made. It's beautiful. If you got the means to go there, we ought to go look at it. Or look at a palm tree. I always wanted to live in a place where there's palm trees when I was a kid. I sent a picture once a month to my sister. I said, look, I own a palm tree. <laughs> it's amazing. It's, enjoy it. But why would we forsake all these things and experiences in life and, and only live where the gospel is and, and build our whole life around 
the worship of, the, of God instead of squeezing it in whenever it happens to fit in our uh, busy schedule of appointments and other things. Why? Back in Acts 1. One, they were in Jerusalem in that upper room. Why? The Lord told them to. Salvation's a command. Don't forsake the assembly of the saints. Well, I had this going on. If things come up, that happens. She's going to have to run a graduation for the school this year. It's on a Wednesday. Ain't nobody else to do it. Sometimes those things happen. Showed up in work clothes. There's been several times I showed up in work clothes. <laughs> she had to bring me clothes to change into her. I just smelled so bad I wouldn't change. We're commanded to do that. God commands us to. And the second reason, they had only their Lord and their God in their minds in love because they loved him. They loved him. If I found out my brother had come to San Diego and was here for three days and then left and didn't come up and say hi to me, I would be wounded. That hurt my feelings. And then my true brother was down here and tried his best to meet me for lunch. and we couldn't, It didn't work out, but we talked on the phone for a half hour. I was tickled to death. He, he wanted to meet up for lunch. That was precious to me. Want to in love, don't we? Verse 11 says, Which also <clears throat> said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. Now let's hear about him until he comes again. Let's tell others about him until he comes again. While that door's still open. Verse 8 says, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. I'll send you all over. You're going to do those things. Why? Because when he ascended on high, he lived captivity captive, and he gave gifts unto men. That's what Paul was talking about in Ephesians 4. This right here. He gave him gifts. I'm going to send my, my Holy Ghost to you and be with you and equip you to do this. And you go preaching all the words. World. And Paul continued in Ephesians 4 9. And he said, Now he that ascended, the one that went up, what is it but that he also descended first in the lower parts of the earth? That's the one that came down for us. And he that descends the same also that ascended up far above all the heavens that he might feel all things. Why? Because we know who he is. We know who he is. We know what he did. He condescended to this earth for us. Well, it's our reasonable service. <laughs> Two days a week or an hour. <laughs> what, re what a reasonable thing to show up worshiping every day, every thought. That's reasonable, isn't it? As many times as he'll be pleased to allow me and let me on this earth, make me look to him, that's reasonable. That's reasonable. He commands it, and we want to. That's what I'm getting at. And we're of one accord. One accord. I won't keep you no longer, but I'll run through this real quick. What are, what are believers? Well, that's not my experience. Well, I'm not talking about somebody else. I'm talking about believers. Those that's in that upper room. This upper room, the upper room in Kingsport or, or New Jersey or, or St. Petersburg, Florida, or wherever it is. Believers, they're of one accord. They're of one accord on the gospel. They, they see eye to eye. There's no disagreements on it. That very one that descended, that condescended, is the only one that can ascend. And I in him. If I'm ever going to be made like him and ascend, it's going to be in him. My sin was so great, he had to physically come down to this earth and, and represent me and live for me and die for me and be risen for me. And right now he's got to intercede for me until he finally comes and gets me and transforms me into him. Me made just like him. They see eye to eye. Well, I don't know about this. Well, I don't know about that either. Lord's people see eye to eye. We have, we're one accord. We got that down pat. This word is the word of God. As he gives us light in it, it don't change. It's so. And if, if I don't understand it, it's not the word's fault. It's my fault. This is God's word. And, and that God's sovereign. He does all things according to his will. Everything that happens, down to the molecules and whatever they're made up of. Electrons orbiting a nucleus. We can't even imagine those things, and that's good. That ought to give us a hint of how majestic and mighty he is. He's a sovereign God. He does what he wants to do, and what he does is right. We see eye to eye. We're of one accord on, on 
All mankind born of Adam, that's all of us, depraved. And we ought to invent new words that make that sound worse. Dead. Graveyard dead. We're a bunch of dead dogs, sinners. And and we see eye to eye. We're of one accord on election. Not just on the doctrine of election. We could be eye to eye with the doctrine of election with Pharisees. They believed in election, didn't they? God chose people and it just happened to be them. Like I think he did a fine job. I'm wonderful. Not the doctrine of election. We see eye to eye. We're of one accord of the God of election. Election is unto salvation. And that's the means he was pleased to pick some and put them in Christ. That's amazing. Why? Because Christ, the Holy One of Israel, he's the elect. We have to be put in him by his grace. And we see eye to eye. We're of one accord on the Lord calling his people to himself. And he does it by the Holy Spirit through the preaching of Christ, through the truth. And only the truth, nothing but the truth. And it's 100% his doing. Nobody made a decision to help him out. Nobody happened to show up in the right place at the right time and how lucky they are. Absolutely not. He does it through the preaching, one-on-one, and the hearing. That's how faith comes. We see eye to eye on those things for his. The law being completely and totally filled full when our head said it's finished well now you got to keep no no you don't it's finished we don't see eye to eye on those things if you think there's something left for man to do now is there something left for us to do we ought to love and joy and be long suffering yeah do it all you want lord told us that the other night wasn't it or the other morning now go show mercy <laughs> you've seen me be merciful you now here practice <laughs> do it all you want you're gonna mess it up try again <laughs> We see eye to eye on us. We're of one accord on those things. And one accord in knowing the promise of God to keep all his children and and not by their help or not by their own doing. He's going to keep us by his doing until we're made like the Lord Jesus Christ and presented faultless before his presence of his glory with exceeding joy on both parties. It'll be happy about it. Blows my mind. He'll be happy. <laughs> He's going to be happy. Just This is great. But, but buddy, is it? This is good. And that's the kind of room I want to be in. That eternal upper room because that's where he is. Why wouldn't I? If I don't want to do that, on, do that on this earth, what makes you think I want to do that for absolute infinite eternity? But if we want to here, I sure want to then. I sure want to then. Let's pray again. Father, draw us, gather us together. Make us rejoice and happy in what Christ has done. Make us see eye to eye, be of one chord. Make us sing that song together. Worthy is the Lamb. Forgive us our sins, Lord. And forgive our unbelief. And forgive our brethren and those that you sent trial to and pain. And comfort them, Lord. Draw them nigh. It's because of Christ we ask these things. Amen. All right, brethren. If you will, we'll stand and sing number 228. I should have told you to leave a marker earlier. My faith has found a resting place.
and that he died for me. My heart is leaning on the word, the written word of God. Salvation by my Savior's name, salvation through his blood. I need no Sunday morning, normal time, 945, and we'll dismiss. They'll be with you this week. Thank you.